OK, welcome to our second ever virtual field day with the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative and the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Today we're talking about bison, the return of them specifically to Minneopolis State Park, how fire, grazing and persistence play a role in prairie recovery. So last year we did, we focused on Hole in the Mountain and we did a one day field day with all four modules. And we discovered that even though people were still really excited to learn and wanted to know more, uh, you just get tired in a virtual meeting after sitting for four hours, no matter how excited you are <laughs> about what we're talking about. So this year we broke it up into two days. So we'll do two modules today and then two modules tomorrow. And for everybody listening who's like, what's well, a module? <laughs> They're each about an hour and all of your wonderful panelists who are on the screen today participated in them. And so we're going to show a video of them talking about a specific aspect of Miniopa and their work. And then we'll focus questions on that video. And before I go any further, I'm going to have everybody who's here with us. Not every. OK, that was a lie. I'm going to have our panelists <laughs> and our PRI folks introduce themselves. We're going to start with Prairie Reconstruction Initiative. These are the people who are working behind the scenes to bring you these fun Fun field days. Uh, Jess, let's start with you. Hey everyone, I am Jessica Dowler. I am the wildlife biologist for the Western South Dakota Complex uh, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So I cover Sand Lake, Huron, and Lake Andes Wetland Management Districts, and I am stationed out of Sand Lake National Wildlife Refuge, and I have been on the PRI advisory team for since the beginning, but this is my first event on the field days and webinars team. So I'm excited to be here. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Becky Yesser. I'm a biologist with the US Fish and Wildlife Service out of the Detroit Lakes Wetland Management District in Northwest Minnesota. I've been on the PRI advisory team since the beginning, just like Jess, and I've been on the field days team, I think since 2013. Oh, we didn't practice this with Craig. Go for it, Craig. Sorry. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name's uh, Craig Meyer. I'm the coordinator of the Tallgrass Prairie and Oak Savannah Fire Science Consortium um, based at University of Wisconsin, Madison, and we cover the uh, prairie portions of about uh, of 12 states, so approximately from Fargo, North Dakota, uh, down to Lawrence, Kansas, and over to Columbus, Ohio. I've been with the um, Priot for a few years and joined the the field days uh, team last year. Um, so excited to um, help share the the fire story uh, here at Miniopa more broadly. And uh, yeah, it's been very very fun to be working on this uh, and excited to uh, hear all of the the videos and discussion today. So thanks. Morning, everyone. I'm uh, Tom Skelling. I am the biologist at Union Slough National Wildlife Refuge and the Iowa Wetland Management District, and I've been part of uh, the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative advisory team since since it started, and also the Field Days team since it started. So, uh, about ten years, I guess. And he keeps trying to escape, but we just won't let him. So, <laughs> okay, we will eventually. All right. So now we're going to have the panel participants do the same thing in alphabetical order. And I didn't look up who goes first, but I'm pretty sure it's Craig because we have B last names. Good morning. My name is Craig Beckman. Uh, I was the manager at Blue Mountain State Park uh, for for two or three years. And then most recently um, I'm at Flandre State Park now, but I was the manager at Minneopa State Park from 2016 to 2021, which was the the really the first five years that the the bison were at that park. Scott, I think it's you. Yep, uh, Scott Kidoka, former Minneopa area naturalist, uh, now retired. I think Ashley, you're next. 
Ashley Stevens. I'm the current park manager here at Miniopa State Park. Um, when Craig went over to Flandreau, I came into this position to continue management within the park and carry it forward into the future. Molly Trandall Nelson. I'm the regional resource specialist out of the New Ulm office and I cover the southern region for DNR parks and trails. Perfect. We're ready. Wonderful. And eventually I'm we should have Gwen Westerman joining us as well. And she is a professor at Minnesota State University Mankato and also is Dakota and shares a really unique and good perspective in the videos. And so we're super excited that she could participate with us um, and share a little bit of her knowledge with us, which is awesome. Okay, logistical things. If um, those of you who aren't speaking want to turn off your videos, that sounds great to me. A couple other things, because we're going to be showing some pretty um, long, well, okay, I shouldn't say it that way, some pretty exciting videos. <laughs> They're not just long. So we're going to be showing you some pretty exciting videos, but they do bog down ba bandwidth. So some things that you can do if you're connected to VPN, disconnect because VPN uses bandwidth. You can also go into your network settings and see how many background processes are running, and you can stop or pause those background processes. Clear your browser cache. That's another way to kind of free up space and turn off any other devices in your house that are using Wi-Fi, including your cell phone, which is probably right next to you. When we play the videos, I won't be able to, I've done all these things already in my house, and so there's nothing else I can do to make the connectivity better. So if it's blurry or the sound is lagging, you might just have to bear with it. And um, you can always, these will be posted on the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative website, and so you can always watch later so that you get a better sense of what was happening if it was garbled or not moving as smoothly for you. Okay, now I'm going to share my screen so I can walk you through some of these um, tips and tricks for using Teams. I know a couple of folks were like, I haven't used Teams in so long, so I'm not really sure what's going on with it and how to make it all work. Okie one second. Here we go. Everybody should be seeing my screen, which has teams up on it. So um, a little bit different. We are going to use um, a web service called Padlet to ask questions. And the reason why that's really, we'll walk you through how to use it. Don't panic if you're like, Padlet, I don't even know what that is. It's OK, we'll walk you through it. Um, the, what's nice about that is it memorializes the questions that you ask. And even if you don't get your question answered in a module, people can answer those questions later and we can send the Padlet out to the group. So you might have had that same question and you don't have to watch the whole virtual field day all over again. You'll just be able to look at that Padlet, scan through the questions that were asked and see the answers from the panel participants. Now, that being said, What's the best part of a real field day? We're all chatting with each other, sharing ideas, talking about everything. So we're gonna use the meeting chat, which is right here, this little pop-up bubble to say hi. And one of the first things we're gonna have you do is write your name, who you work for, and just give a little wave or say hi, everybody. And so go ahead and type into the chat just so you can kind of practice using it. So we absolutely, and fully appreciate and encourage side conversations. And that's what we'll use this chat for, for everybody to sort of chat with each other. If you um, saw something in the Padlet and you were like, oh my gosh, I wanna talk to somebody else about this, or I want more information, this is a way for you to do that. So that's an option. Um, okay, what else? Good job, you guys are already doing it. Great job. Introduce yourselves, type it in the chat, saying who you are. So if um, you have a question and something's not working for you, this is also the place where you want to type that in. Like, I don't know what's happening, but I can't get my sound to work, my audio to work. We'll do the best we can. Most of the time it's on your end and it's it's tough. It's not something that we can figure out how to do. Great, I'm just gonna mute you real quick. There we go. Uh, other thing, 
people. If you ever want to see the list of participants, you can just click this little people button and it'll tell you everybody who's in here. Don't panic if your name is under the presenter mode. That's the only way I could do it in Teams to make sure that the DNR panel participants have a way to share their screen if they if there's a particular visual they want to share. So it broke the meeting up into attendees and participants, unfortunately. If you're just like so frustrated, nothing's working. Ah, I can't make it happen. Just use this little hand button here. It'll highlight you. We'll know that you have a question and we'll be able to call on you. If I'm saying something, you know, that's like Gwen's here. If I'm saying something that's really funny or great, um, you can just do a reaction like this. This is my reaction because Gwen's here. Um, so you can do <laughs> any of that. We're not going to use breakout rooms or any of those things. Also, I probably should have done this first. If um, you need accessibility, if you have some accessibility needs or you want to do closed captioning, you can go to these three little more dots, language and speech, Jeez, turn on live sorry. captions. And that just turns on live captions for you. So that's a good way to do it. You can also go into settings and see some more accessibility settings, which is just another way to do captions and sign language and other things like that. All right. That is all of the team's stuff. Any questions right out of the gate? Making sure. And if you're um, not presenting and you want to go ahead and turn off your camera, that would be great. I'm going to pause, Gwen, if you're OK with it, and I'm just going to have you introduce yourself really quick because um, you're you're with us now and you're an important person and we want people to see who you are. <laughs> If I'd known that, I'd worn a better shirt. <laughs> <laughs> you look great, Gwen. <laughs> I'm Gwen Westerman. Um, I um, am also Dakota, Sisituan Wachpetuan Dakota, and I've been working with this team for quite a while on landscape and bison interpretation. So I'm really glad to be here. Oh, yeah, and I teach at Minnesota State Mankato. <laughs> Don't worry, Gwen, I got that part earlier, so you okay. just filled in the rest. <laughs> I love it. All right, Becky, Esther, I'm going to have you type the first Padlet link into the chat. What are you excited to learn about today? Um, and then we'll walk everybody through how to use the Padlet. So. So if you can see that link that she just typed in, it's got a big, beautiful bison on it. And I'm going to share my screen so that everybody can see where they're supposed to land and end up. Yay. So this is what it should look like when you get there. Um, this is just our test padlet. We're running you through the test. So in order to post something, you go down to this uh, little check right here. You just click open a box. Um, we'll have you type in the subject uh, your name, which I know can sometimes be scary, but that'll help us as we call on you later with questions. So if it was me, I type a little name right here. Now I'm going to write something incredible. I love virtual field days, but not as much as real ones and then you just click publish and it goes right here you can also add pictures or photos or all kinds of stuff and it's just a way to get excited about what we're going to learn about and what we're going to see and also make sure that you know how to use this platform to to ask questions it's just a little bit more interactive i'm going to wait to make sure folks are able to use this successfully. Let me know if you're struggling at all. I'm going to give it uh, about a minute to make sure that this is working well for you. So just a reminder, in order to get here, you have to click the link that's in the chat. Padlet doesn't believe I'm a human. It's upsetting. Is it not working for you, Molly, or is it just giving you this little bug icon? 
posting a link in the chat. Becky, can you go ahead and post that link again in the chat just to make sure it's at the top for everyone? So it's right here. It's this chat right here. And remember, you click the chat button, and then here's the Padlet link. Click on that link, and that should take you to right here. There we go. Good job, Shelly. And also, if it's um, overwhelming to you to have your name in bold at the top, you can also do a dash dash with your name just so we know who you are. And it's just a way to help us follow along as you're typing stuff in. Let us know if that's not working for any reason. I'm going to give it, I have to have an epiphany. These are high and lofty. <laughs> I hope to have an epiphany. We hope to give you one. It's always good to set that bar real, real high. <laughs> Go, Richard Milda's here. Practicing my pronunciation under my breath. Bison and Prairie Management. Wonderful. Oh yeah, thanks Molly, that's a good thing. Um, so you, you'll wanna use Google Chrome or Safari or Microsoft Edge. Uh, that's a really good point. It doesn't always work with some browsers. So I think maybe Firefox it doesn't work with. So not to promote Google products, but Google Pro Chrome is generally one of the best ones that helps you open those links. Thanks for that. Look, Dublin as a panelist and tech support. That's what we like to see. We're all here to help each other out. All right, y'all are getting this. Keep working. We have walked you through all the things. Uh, Becky and the other Prairie Reconstruction Initiative peeps will be um, putting some links in the chat, helping you out with troubleshooting in the chat. But this platform is where we're going to ask questions. So when we get to the main um, Q&A, um, or even Becky, when we start the first module, if you want to post the Q&A, um, Padlet link in there, that would be great because then if somebody has a question as they're watching the video, they can just automatically type it into the Padlet in the background. If you're like me and you would forget your question by the time the video is done, that's a way that we can manage that. I like it. A lot of people want to learn about incorporating bison um, into prairie management, which is great because you're at the right field day. So that's a good way to start on a Wednesday. I did just have to look at my calendar and make sure it was Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we're winning today. Okay, good work. This is working well. So I'm going to back out of here and stop sharing my screen. And I, we're just going to get started with the first module, but I'm going to pause before I do and just double check. Does anybody have any questions or concerns before we get rolling with the video? All right, well, make sure you have your popcorn, your Sour Patch Kids, your beverage of choice. We're ready to go. Becky, I'm going to have you, um, uh, well, Becky or Craig or Jess or Tom or any of you, <laughs> just tell me to make sure that you can hear sound and everything's working well. Minneopa is a place that not only carries yes. our language in its name, but also carries the stories of our people. 
uh, who live throughout this region. Um, its importance to me um, is as if it's a little safe haven. Um, the bison are here, the plants and animals are here, um, the birds, you hear them singing all around us, and it's, it's a respite. But it's also Dakota Makoche. This is Dakota homeland. And that also makes it especially important to me and to us. But also that we have been involved from early on with the, the reintegration of the bison herd. And I think that shows the respect that the park staff, the DNR, has for our connection to this place. And that's very powerful. Um, we are the third oldest state park in Minnesota. We have been around uh, since 1905, though I do like to say that people have been gathering here uh, for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Uh, the park was established uh, basically because of that double waterfall. And uh, really for, you know, the first, um, until the mid 1960s, that's what it was, 110 acres. Um, as the years went by, they added. And the northern portion of Minneopa, a completely different landscape with a, a prairie setting, um, a river valley setting, and uh, so you get to kind of experience the river valley wooded portion of southern Minnesota as well as the, the native prairie of southern Minnesota. So it's a great park for seeing all that southern Minnesota has to offer in its wild areas. I always say when I do an introduction to the park is, yeah, we've been around since 1905, but this has been a gathering place for hundreds, right, yeah. thousands of years. We as Europeans didn't discover Yellowstone National Park. No. We, I mean, all these places that we have set aside is because American Indians found reverence to it. And we just discovered what they had already discovered or knew. We had that last glacial event come through 10 to 14,000 years ago, pretty much, you know, just grind everything down. The glaciers retreated. And then what happened up down by Browns Valley at the border of North Dakota, or South Dakota, Minnesota, was really when those glaciers are moving, they're also pushing debris. And so they actually pushed enough debris that it almost builds up a dam. And inside that is probably was ice. And then as that ice started melting, that dam had formed, but then behind it, all this water from when the glaciers retreating and melting created what we call glacial Lake Agassiz. So if you think about Fargo, North Dakota, you have this incredibly flat surface. That was the bottom of this lake. And so you imagine this huge water, bigger than the Great Lakes combined, and suddenly that dam collapsed. And all of a sudden you have this wall of water moving to the southeast, and it's just grinding down. It's creating this huge valley that we see that can be as wide as five miles and hundreds of feet deep. And so where the Minnesota River is now, that didn't create this. It was this glacial river warrant. And as it hit in the Mankato area, it did this bounce almost, where now it's going to the northeast. And people used to think it was hard rock, but we don't have that hard rock down here. So what Kerry Jennings, the great ge geologist for Minnesota thinks is that it hit another channel from another smaller glacial lake and that it followed. And you can see that when you get downtown Mankato, but for whatever reason, when it got up to Cambria, it jumped out of that channel and then it created the channel that now we see to the Mississippi River. So again, the Minnesota River is what we call an underfit river. It doesn't fit the valley that it is in, and so it really has a wide area that it can move um, in it. Unfortunately, that's not what's happening today. It's actually straightening out. 
So we went from 335 miles to 317.9. And that river shouldn't do that. River should always be meandering. This park um, has a lot of prairie and the reason it has a lot of prairie is because it's very rocky. And if you can see all the rocks out here, it's not good farmland. And um, it's, that's the reason this prairie survived. So our um, bison range, the fenced area is 330 acres roughly. Um, and most of that is prairie with some oak savanna. And then we also have um, acres of uh, more fire dependent communities, um, woodlands on the outside of the bison range. A third of it was farmed, and so that was restored, partially restored in the 90s. Um, I'd say about 50 or so acres is still old fields um, with low diversity. And then the remnant areas vary. Um, the soils here are only 18 inches deep, which is incredibly shallow. Um, so it's more of a very dry prairie and parts of it were good and uh, parts of it were very invaded by woody invasives like cedar, uh, buckthorn, and actually plum is a problem out here in sumac. So um, there's varying degrees of quality, I would say, out here. We didn't know that there were significant cultural resources out here until we started um, looking into a bison reintroduction. And we did some prescribed burns and the archeologists followed um, after those burns and they found over 8,000 surface artifacts, which is one of the largest um, sites in Minnesota State Parks. The archeologists came out here and they just started walking and they had these little flags, these little red flags, and they kept putting them down and putting them down, thousands of these flags in an area. And it was all these parts of when uh, people were making um, arrowheads or spear points and it was just the flakes that were left, but they could see it. And you think about, they found other things like pieces of pottery and they found spear points and arrowheads. All that was sitting there just above the surface. It took a prescribed burn and train eyes that they were able to see that. And then they also dig some smaller um, excavations. They wanted to go deeper, but then they hit that harder sandstone. So they could only go a few feet, but they found firecrack rock meaning that people were sitting on this bluff looking over the Minnesota River, making their spear points and arrowheads, maybe waiting for the bison to come through. We don't really know. That was the one thing they didn't find that we wanted to see, but the state archeologist is 95%, 97% sure that that's what they were probably doing was hunting bison. It is a huge cultural site. We say that people have been camping at Minneopa State Park for 8,000 years. <laughs> and so it was just really cool to see that history um, and know that our site was being used for that long. When we bought it um, in the 19, late 1960s going into the 1970s, it really stayed prairie. You know, we have aerial photos from 1984. We even have photos from the 90s. And you really see very little woody vegetation. Um, what you see is your oak savannas. So you got these big, huge bur oaks and then a lot of cedars. Um, and it's funny because the park was doing wild um, prescribed burns as late as early as the 1970s. But somehow there was a period where it just we weren't doing enough. And I don't know if it was prescribed burning or woody vegetation removal, and it just exploded. And really the sumac, and even now as you drive through, you can see how that sumac just takes over everything. And the battle for it is, you know, we got the bison now, we're doing prescribed burning, we're doing uh, cutting of it, we're doing herbicide, but even those four, the sumac, is just outrageous for a native plant. Now we get a lot of plum too, but man, it's the sumac that just really drives, I think our management of how we're gonna try to maintain this as prairie. But it changed because we brought in the bison and that really has, I suppose you could say forced our hand into saying, well, we need to provide them 
the place that they need to be. So we have to do this stuff where before it might have been easier enough to just say, well, no, we need to do this or we need to do that. We'll do that later. And honestly, Prairie has always been probably on the low bottom of most management decisions. And it's not just here in Minneopa, but it's in other places because people don't take Prairie serious enough. And honestly, if you don't have a love affair for Prairie, it's easy to oversee that. One of the goals was try to slowly reestablish this prairie, the grassland at Minneopa. Um, and we kind of took a, uh, a prescribed burn approach, really. We anchored in one location and we kept working out from that anchor, never forgetting about that and continuing to work out from there. The other approach has to do with the whole reason that Minneopa was chosen in the first place, which was because um, the other herd that we had in Minnesota State Parks, which is Blue Mounds, has a large bison range, but it doesn't give the viewers a real up close experience. Minneopa was chosen on the other hand because it provided a whole different kind of experience with the, the road that goes right through the middle of the bison range. So it was balancing resource management with giving the visitors to Minneopa the best experience to see the bison. And ideally, those two concepts are tied together with the visitors leaving with an appreciation of bison, prairie, and the importance of grassland in the park. So one of the goals that I have as the park manager is to really work on maintaining the resources that we have in the park. They are very unique and there is a vast array of them. Um, when we look at our woodland areas, we do have some invasive species that we are working on trying to manage. And then as we move over into this prairie area, we are working really hard to maintain the prairie within this area and try to exclude some of the woody vegetation that has moved in over the years. Some of that is just through additional maintenance, such as spraying, um, the mowing of woody vegetation, um, and then some of it is also just the browsing of the bison and burning of the prairie, which we work really closely with the resource management staff um, to try to make sure that we are all working together to try to restore this area. Um, once we get beyond the resource management, we're also looking at really maintaining the features within the park. Um, as we look at the historic mill at where we have Setman Mill, um, it does need some maintenance to ensure that that historic mill remains here for another hundred years within the park. So we're really looking at doing the maintenance for those as well as trying to restore any um, trail segments in the park that have had to be closed over the years due to erosion and things like that. Our first goal is to, now that we have bison out here, our first goal is to keep the bison happy because happy bison do not test fences. <laughs> and then that keeps the manager happy. So, um, but our goal is also not to um, destroy the prairie in the process. So we have a utilization goal of 50%, meaning we don't want the bison to eat more than 50% of the forage out here. Um, and that's overall across the site. They will have favorite areas where that's higher than 50%, and then they have other areas where they don't eat it at all. So um, that's one of the main goals. And then also increasing the forb diversity, especially for pollinators. Um, and we are seeing that that's occurring as they eat more grasses. Um, we'd like to reduce the woody cover out here. That's been a challenge. Um, there was about a 20 plus year period where this park, this side of the park did not get burned at all. So you can imagine not burning a prairie for that long, what happens, cedar trees come in, a lot of woodies. So our goal now is to reduce that and also to, to keep our invasive species down to less than 20% of the total um, uh, plants out here. Any, like any state park, our major goal is to show the public what this landscape looked to pre-European settlement. And that is what we're really trying to do with the bison and um, this Minnesota conservation herd um, is to explain to people how much really the landscape and what we see here has changed. And to be welcoming that we weren't the ones that 
supposedly discovered this site, that people have been living here for thousands of years, and we are just a tiny part of that history. All right. That is the end of our first video. And so we're going to go right to our Q&A board. Um, Becky typed that into the chat for you all. And um, oh, there's some claps for the video. That's good. I hope the connectivity worked for everybody. I know that can be a challenge. But like I said, if you can close some of those things in the background. That's helpful. What I'm going to do is ask the panel participants to go ahead and turn your video on so we can see who we're talking to. And then just like we did with the what are we excited to learn about? We're going to have you um, click this little plus sign here to ask a question. And like we said, if that is not working for some reason, you can also type your question into the chat and We'll ask it out loud for you and we want this to be as interactive as possible. So we are going to have you don't panic, but we're going to have you give voice to your question. So when you type it in here and you ask a question, um, go ahead and just put your name in here somewhere so that way we know who we're who we're calling on. And then um, Becky, Craig, Tom and Jess are going to help us kind of facilitate some of these questions as well. And I forgot to say this earlier, so we're going to ask questions on this module until about 945 and we will break at 945, even if we're really energized and excited about what we're talking about, because breaks are important and we'll break for a full 15 minutes just to give you a, you know, re refill your popcorn, use the restroom, do whatever it is that you need to do in that 15 minutes. And we'll come back at 10 and start the second module. So if that sounds good. I can see people are typing in some questions which is great. Oh, and if you have a, if you heard from a particular person in the panel that you wanted to ask that question to, you can direct it at them or you can just direct it to everybody. That's okay as well. The anticipation, right? Panel participants. I think Craig Meyer, who's Craig number one today, might have a question he wants to ask to get us started here. Let's see here. Uh, we had in the chat, Vanette, do you want to give voice to your question or do you want me to read it for you? Either is fine. I'm going to ask it. She asked, How many buffalo? Do you have a Miniopa State Park? Molly, do you want to take it? I was going to say, Ashley probably knows the exact number <laughs> better than I do right now. Um, we currently have 32 bison in okay. the prairie. Um, we are currently expecting approximately 15 calves. We have 15 cows that are eligible to calve this spring. So um, obviously that will bump up those numbers during the summer months, but we're typically in that 30 to 35 for overwintering numbers. As Molly talked about in that module, working to keep um, the foraging to 50% overall. And it, higher numbers would reduce that during those winter months. I like that phrase, eligible to calf. I'm gonna use that again. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard it quite said like that. <laughs> Eligible to, to calf. I like it. Jamie Ellis, would you like to give voice to your question in the Padlet? And you know what I'm going to do. Oh, you are supposed to keep me honest. You mean that? Oh. In the Padlet, you asked a little question right here. Well, sure. Yeah, because right, it's right. Ju I just picked up on that 20% number for um, that was mentioned. Is, does, is that. How 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 is that twenty percent me measured? Is that cover composition composition density? You know something sure. else, and then how how then how 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 did you settle on that on that twenty percent? And oh by um, the way, th that was a yeah. Thank you for 
a, a great uh, introduction to Miniopa. I would say our 20% is probably our um, our pie in the sky dream number, <laughs> especially since every time you cut a cedar tree down there, you get about 20 mullein plants come up. So um, we use the grassland monitoring team protocol, if anyone is familiar with that, where you're looking at the, um, basically you're doing composition of, um, it kind of looks at like how invaded a, a remnant prairie is and it so we're we track it every three years and we have some one or two years of data before the bison came out and we look at um what the invasives are what all the species are out there um but then also like there's kind of this um tier of how invaded it is so we kind of use that to track um and unfortunately we're getting um wild parsnip that's coming in from the roadsides so we're also trying to stay on top of that as well. Um, so it's an ongoing battle with invasives, as you can imagine. But that's kind of how we came up with that number and how we um, measure it. Okay, thank Yeah, thank you very much. Great work. Um, Troy, are you willing to give voice to your question that you typed in the chat here? It's more exciting when when you all do, just so you know. <laughs> can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, perfect. All right. Yeah. Sorry. So I was just I was just curious on what the what the fencing looks like for bison. Um, does it differ compared to what we're using on other units for you know for cattle, for example? And then um, what does perimeter fencing versus interior cross fence look like? And then what were rotations? Um, or rotations like in each paddock. Hey, Craig, do you want to tell your story of um, adding more wires to the fence? We started with, sure. um, so I'll just say we started with a fence different from our fence at Blue Mounds for bison. We wanted something that um, didn't look quite as um, obtrusive out on the landscape and then we also knew we had a lot of deer out there and other you know animals we wanted to be able to cross in between and so uh, we tried to make it wildlife friendly as well and in those efforts we made it a little bit too wildlife friendly um, so Craig can take over from there yeah, so the the fence at Miniopa is, I believe it's five strands of high tensile fence. So we avoided barbed wire and we avoided any sort of woven wire fence. Um, so it's about six feet tall, five strands of high tensile, um, which is which is good for most of most of the perimeter. What we did find though is that they're depending on grazing locations, preferred grazing locations for the bison. Um, there was a few places that put them right next to the fence and uh, they continue to use those areas over and over. So those areas we did have to add either additional strands of high tensile, or in some cases we added uh, like hog panels to those because um, during calving season, the calves fi quickly figured out how they could easily slide in and out of the high tensile fence underneath. And um, not not a real big deal in terms of them getting stuck out there or anything because they're just going to slide back in. But a big deal when you have visitors hiking trails around your the perimeter of the fence um, because visitors can come up on that calf pretty quick. And uh, there's always a, a little bit of a concern that if they come up on a calf real quick and mom is on the other side of that fence, that there's going to be possibly some issues. So um, for the most part, though, that fence has worked fine. Interior fences. Um, they are the exact same thing. They're high tensile fences. Um, those though we have beefed up with either cattle panels or hog panels um, and added some electric fence to those interior, not, not grazing paddocks, more holding paddocks. Um, we had to beef those up because uh, the first year that we captured the bison for um, our herd management day, um, they were only held in one of those interior interior paddocks for a day or two before they broke out, and um, which isn't something that we wanted to deal with again. So we've slowly been beefing those panels up, beef, no pun intended there. 
He's got jokes. He's got jokes. All right, we've got a bunch of questions coming in here. Molly, did you want to add something? I was just going to add um, the question also asked about rotating. We don't rotate the bison in the 330 acres other than with the patch burn grazing, trying to get them to go to areas that we recently burned. Um, and then there are some areas that I mentioned in the video that they they repeatedly hit, especially like sedge meadows. They really like sedges. So last year we started with um, two strands of um, electric wire. Only one of them was live and we just kept them out of that sedge meadow for a few months. Um, so instead of rotating um, the bison, we're rotating some exclosure fences to give those areas a rest. Jason, do you want to give voice to your question? And actually, before you do, I just I'm gonna make a public service announcement. So if your Padlet isn't working, uh, the Prairie Construction Initiative team is working furiously behind the scenes to make sure that they add your question for you to this Padlet, just so that we capture them so that you can see them all in one place later. And then panel participants, just so you all know, when we get done, um, with this module, if you all can put the Cliff Notes version of your answer by using the comment tab, that'll help us keep track of the answers. You don't have to do that in real time while you're trying to answer it in real time. It's just for later to capture those. Okay, Jason, are you ready? Can you hear me? Yes. I just wanted to know where you acquired the buffalo from, and then did you get them, and you said, you had some calving, so how many did you get initially? Uh, the the initial herd, uh, eight um, cow calf combinations, a couple yearlings in there, um, came from Blue Mountain State Park, which is the other other herd in the Minnesota State Park system, and then three of the bison came from. Uh, the Minnesota Zoo. We've got a working partnership with the Minnesota Zoo. Um, and uh, so it started with 11 bison in September of 15. And the 11 that came in um, would have been all uh, genetically tested to ensure that, at least to the best of testing's ability right now, that there was no cattle genetics brought in with them. Okay, sorry, that was me. I was doing too many things in the background. All right, this one is from an anonymous person who had a question about sumac. If you would like to give voice to that, that would be great. It's this one right here that I'm going to turn pink. Or peach, I don't know. Hi, this is Brian Montroy. Um, I just wanted to know what management technique has been most successful or what you found to be most successful when controlling sumac. I'll start with that one and then Craig, if you want to add, if I miss anything. I always think with invasive species, um, anytime you can herd it twice in the same growing season, uh, that is helpful. And while sumac is native, it acts like invasive. So uh, we treat it as an invasive out there in the prairie. So a lot of times what we'll do is um, burn it and that just makes sumac angry and it comes back even better but it gets it kind of down to a lower, um, not as tall and a little bit more manageable where you could go in and follow up with either um, forestry mowing with like we use a skid steer with a forestry mower on it, or you can um, do some very careful selective um, foliar spray um, with Garlon. And because we have native prairie out there, um, we do do that, but we are careful about it um, because we worry about the prairie underneath. Um, so those have been a couple things. Um, anything else, Craig, that you guys have been doing? Backpack sprayers, mostly a lot of time out there just retreating. Uh, yeah, I'll add um, during my time there and then turn it over to Ashley for the last um year plus there so yeah we did essentially what molly molly laid out um burning in the forestry head made it more manageable to do the herbicide treatment so you weren't trying to do herbicide treatment on five to eight foot tall sumac plants so that we could be more precise um, by trying to spray sumac that was below knee height 
essentially. But it it did seem I agree with Molly 100% that that burning seemed to just anger the sumac, and um, in a in my opinion, for the long term, so you didn't have to keep revisiting over and over again, it was the foliar treatment. And then treating it that like a prescribed burn anchor in one place, foliar treatment, and then make sure you return to that spot each year and then slowly keep moving out. But I think Ashley took that to even a, a higher level this year. So I'll turn it over to her. And I will say it, uh, we were doing growing season burns um, on the sumac. So very late uh, spring, into May, even into June, and then um, early September when the grass is really green is when we're we're going at that sumac with fire. So one of the things that we did this year um, is we actually did have a contractor come in and when we worked with Molly's team to um, bring in a contractor and do some wide scale herbicide treatments. That did seem to to help. We will see this year if it was how effective it really was. Um, but last year was a really dry year and it made it really hard to do some of those prescribed burns that we were planning on trying to do. So we started trying one additional new technique last year and that was with um, doing multiple mowings within an area. Um, some of the research that we were doing was saying that if you can come in and you can mow it in the middle of summer when it's the most stressed by the heat and things like that, it's going to re-sprout, it's, it's going to become angry, um, just like we had burned it. But if we come through about a month later and mow it again, um, it should really set it back after putting that much effort into regenerating from its root system. So again, we'll see this coming year, how effective that's been. Um, with any invasive species, multiple years of treatment is going to be the most effective. So it's not going to be a magic fix overnight. Um, but our prairie is really limited in how many areas we can really do that in. With all the rocks and boulders that we have um, in there, it's it's limited where we can get that equipment in to do that mowing with that forestry head on the skid loader. So um, otherwise, we've continued with the backpack sprayers and the spot spraying to try to help manage where it is low and easily covered through foliar applications. Again, trying to be really mindful of those prairie plants below and trying to minimize damage to them. All right, we're gonna go to Brandon, your question, just because um, that maybe should have been one that I touched on a little bit sooner because it would give people some better context. But if you wanna give some context and voice to your question, that would be awesome. Yeah, I just like maps. Would it be possible to pull up a map and just kind of walk us through where fences are, kind of where water is, where some of those sites are that they like to graze, things like that. Good thing. And I apologize because, well, I don't apologize. Molly gave me fantastic maps, but I don't know that I have a grazing map. Um, so Molly, let me know if this one, well, and Craig and Ashley, if this one will work for you all to go through it. And you can also point stuff out on the screen too, if that's helpful. I think I'll let Craig or Ashley um, kind of mention where their favorite grazing areas are. I, Craig made a really nice grazing map. I was going to see if I could find it. If you can, that'd be great. And then I'll I'll pull that one up on the screen. <laughs> These are this is our resource management or AKA burn unit map, and you can see how how complex it is. Craig, well, Craig or Ashley, while well, Molly's pulling that up, do you want to just walk them through the site really quick? And then once we get the grazing map up, we can talk more about what that looks like. Sure. Um, so everything that's in the uh, this this line through here, that's actually the entrance road. So the bison range is everything west northwest of this line. And in this, Craig, essentially in the- you. I'm gonna pause you. Okay. We can't see where you're pointing. I think you just have to ask me for control and then I can give it to you. Gotcha. And then we'll be able to see your cursor. Allow. All right, now, now we should be able to see wherever you're pointing. Yep, look, it's even okay. got your little picture. 
Okay, so uh, the line right here, this is actually an entrance road that's dividing some burn un units, but the bison range is everything to the west, northwest of this road here. And the bison range is essentially everything that's open, that's not wooded um, outside of this little piece of private property. So um, everything in here is the bison range and they do have, um, not quite exactly sure if it's the vegetation that's in those areas or if it's the the makeup of the soils but one of their favorite locations is uh right here that's right at the entrance to the bison range for vehicles and it it sure doesn't look like there's much for grazing opportunity there but they have developed um they have developed wallows in that location. So my guess is that, is that it has something to do with the soils in that location that keeps drawing them back to there. So that's a favorite for them. Um, out in the middle of this bigger, bigger, bigger prairie complex is a favorite for them. Um, that's a unique area because it's broken up with um, a number of wet meadows also in that area. So that you don't necessarily see from the road or from um, any any overlooks at all. But when you get out into there, you realize just how wet that area is. Um, those areas, they they just visit those over and over again. Ashley, do they have, have they, oh, one more thing to add was right here, when they first arrived for the first two to three years, this location was a favorite. And this was uh, the fence that the calves continuously went in and out of that fence where we had to actually add hog panels to the fence line to prevent them from doing that. I don't know if they still do that. Ashley would have a better better handle for the last year there. We do still have the occasional calf that will sneak through in some locations. Um, it hasn't been as widespread as Craig has described in the past. Um, it's just every now and again, one will sneak through. The children are unruly and <laughs> they do what they want. Um, generally, if staff go out and, and give them some direction, they do go right back in by mom. Um, and it's only for a couple months and then they're getting big enough and they start staying in. Um, so those favorite spots still are truly favorite spots of theirs. Um, one of the things that Craig didn't touch on that I do wanna share is right along the entrance road, right at the entrance to the Bison Drive, since that was such a favorite spot for them. One of the things that actually Craig had done is he had put in an electric fence to try to keep them back from that exterior fence. And it really wasn't because of the bison, it was because of the people visiting the park. Um, people were parking along the road, it was creating congestion at the entrance. In addition to that, people were getting far too close to the fence and getting closer to the bison than they really should. So it was a way to provide distance between people and the bison. Great job, sorry for my delay. Need seven more screens, but I could be doing this really well. Okay. And I just want to make sure, does that help like kind of walk through? Did you get, I just want to make sure you got all parts of your question answered there. Yeah, thanks. It sounds like water sources are kind of those little shallow depressions and wetlands. And I do want to share that the bison do have a constant water source back in the corral area. So we have provided a water tank for them. So even when it's extremely dry out, um, like it was last summer and there is no standing water within the prairie, they still have that constant water source of fresh, clean water that we're providing. But when the weather is providing those areas where the water does start to pool up, the bison do enjoy those and our watering um, tank becomes a secondary water source to them. Perfect. All right, I wanna ask, um, this one about park goals. Craig Meyer, do you want to give voice to that question? It's this one right here. Sure. And yeah, also, it's funny to think of uh, bison calves sneaking under the fence like uh, domestic cattle calves or toddlers. Um, we were wondering as well for the big picture, uh, since we have a lot of managers of, of other properties here as well, is um, how were the, the goals for the park and bison developed? 
and uh, who gets to have uh, input on that goal development process. I could take a stab at this one and then uh, others can at weigh in. So because we are a state park, uh, we have very specific park plans. So the first thing um, is that the park needs to be a compatible use for bison. So um, there was public input meetings and um, a, a new park, uh, I guess it was an amendment to the park plan was added to, to be able to first introduce bison back into the park. And then also um, because this herd is part of our larger goal of um, bison conservation as part of the DNR and the Minnesota Zoo working together, we also have a um, strategic plan for bison management. And that was created kind of at the same time as we were reintroducing at Miniopa. And that started because we have a goal of reintroducing around 500 animals throughout Minnesota on um, our land or on partners' lands and managing them as one herd, as the Minnesota Bison Conservation Herd. So um, right now we have herds at Blue Mounds, Miniopa, Minnesota Zoo, and then we have partners with Dakota County that have just introduced bison. We have Olmstead County um, at the zoo there, and then a couple other zoos have gotten animals from us. So our, one of our overarching goals is bison conservation and the conservation of the genetics of this herd. And our goal is 500 animals for that to kind of preserve those genetics. So we have that goal. And then the park goal is to, you know, obviously keep our prairie in good condition. And so we also have a park uh, resource management um, unit plan that kind of very specifically outlines the goals for that park. And then we also have a conservation grazing plan that was specifically written before introducing the bison on how we were gonna graze them out there. So state park, lots of plans, public input on, um, all of them except maybe the um, conservation grazing plan and the unit management plan are more internal documents, uh, but the other ones all had public meetings and public input. So did I miss anything, Craig or Ashley? There was lots of planning, probably more planning than anything before the bison could get out there, so. There, yeah, there was lots of planning. A lot of it revolved around resource. I think the the thing that surprised everybody was the t the degree that bison themselves are not not an issue managing. They're they're pretty low key and they're um, and they take care of themselves. But um, I, each unit would be different. But when bison are introduced, we were surprised at the the um, the influx of people that the park received and that hasn't that hasn't stopped I, I anticipated that it would peak and then come back down and level out and it just doesn't seem to be doesn't seem to be happening um, so if bison are introduced to a landscape that has to be a that has to be a factor in planning is how to deal with the people that the bison are going to be attracting When I want to pivot and ask you, um, I'm using my host host with the most, you know, privilege here. I want to ask you a question that's not in the Padlet because I think it's an important question. Um, and as always, you can be like, oh, Megan, Megan, I'm not answering that. <laughs> but so the question I have is because, you know, the this intro video that we just watched starts with you talking about Dakota connections to the prairie and that this is Dakota homeland. What advice would you give to a park manager or a land manager who wants to do a better job of honoring that and working with tribes to make sure, or native people, just to make sure that um, we're being as inclusive and holistic and thoughtful as we can be, as we set out goals and management and bring these pivotal prairie pieces back? So like a big question, <laughs> but I know you can handle it. <laughs> it is a big question. Um, it's important to understand the relationship between Dakota people and the bison and that restoration and what it represents 
um, is also a, rep, a representation of the restoration of, of uh, good working relationships between the state parks and the uh, conservation herd and the tribes um, in a collaborative way. And I don't know that a lot of people know this, but um, uh, my husband Glenn Washicha and, and I were involved it early on in the planning for the return of the bison at um, Miniopa. And so when the first group came, we were there and um, uh, Red Wing Thomas came and sang for them. We prayed for them. Uh, we welcomed them back. And then in our way, we fed everybody who was there, the, the truck drivers, the handlers, the uh, park staff, the um, I can't even remember who else was there, uh, the media. Uh, we fed everybody and um, let them know that, you know, these are our relatives and this is how we welcome our relatives home. So communication, um, uh, just establishing that that connection. Um, We've also worked with the Dakota County Park uh, herd, and they've got a good connection with Prairie Island. And uh, just being open and understanding and knowing that as Dakota people, these are our relatives, so we treat them like family. So sometimes we get kind of protective of them too. <laughs> like when people are sticking their arms through the fences and um, <laughs> getting out of their cars like idiots, but um, uh, we can't be, we can't be everywhere all the time. <laughs> well, Craig and Ashley don't like that either. I can tell you that. <laughs> that makes them just as nervous. Thank you for that. It's, sure. it's good to hear that perspective. And then um, for people who are interested in learning more, Gwen doesn't know I'm going to do this, but I'm going to do it. Gwen wrote a book and it's called Minnesota Makoche. And if you um, don't know where to start and you're afraid of making mistakes, I think it's a great book to read. It's easy to read. And if you were like me and you went to school and your history section just completely blipped over <laughs> Native people and what happened before European settlement, I think this is a really good book that covers the history of this land. Um, in a way that I think can really enhance our ability to be good resource managers and good partners as we do this work. So that's one I would highly recommend. Okay, uh, we have time for maybe just one more question and I'm trying to figure out whose questions I'm gonna ask. Christine, I'm, I think I'm gonna ask, if you wanna give voice to your question, that would be great. Well, you have two questions, but you pick one. You pick which one is most important to ask in this moment. Okay, sure. Um, oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, we sure can. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll follow up with my public engagement question since that's so closely tied to the conversation that just got started, um, which is related to what type of engagement did you do with the public, including city, local landowners? You know, I noticed on your map there were several homes that are really close to the park um, and also tribes prior to implementing both fire and bison management in the park. And what seemed to help the most to get that local support and were there safety concerns from the community you needed to overcome? And I think some of those things have been touched on, but just hoping you could provide a little bit more detail. Um, again, I, I work in Hennepin County, and so um, definitely being aware of public is a really big deal and considering how we can implement different types of prairie management on some of our larger um, easements and protected areas. So I'm um, just very curious how you guys went about that. I think Scott should answer this one because he's our public face, right? Well, he was. I know, he should. <laughs> yeah, Scott, we should mention Scott Kadelka is graciously, um, this was all due to my scheduling stuff. We were supposed to have this field day in December when he still would have been a DNR employee. And now he's got the green DNR retirement jacket. So he graciously <laughs> agreed to 
<laughs> to join us anyway because he's a man who keeps his commitments even after retirement. <laughs> Only for you, Megan. Um, <laughs> Well, I think what's really important in Minneopa is that um, it's been really a community park uh, since the beginning. In fact, uh, it was managed uh, by a board uh, for many years. And really that um, land that the bison is on was purchased because um, back in the late 60s, um, there was talk about downgrading Minneopa to a county or a local park. And really it was the cit citizens of Mankato that came around and said, hey, no, we want this as a state park. It's an important area and uh, helped um, really get that money to buy that land um, that was owned by the Setmans. So I think that spirit of community has always been there. And so when we started that process, um, I think there was uh, a lot of backing uh, for things to improve the park. And um, I think Molly, you can tell me if I'm wrong. It was like 95% was in favor, I think of bringing the bison. So that was really uh, both public comments of written comments. And then when we did the open house and things like that, um, there were a few people that were very unhappy about it. And we recognized um, why, because they lost the ability to go into the prairie. And so we've been trying to um, do other things uh, to bring uh, that back for them. Um, but I think that strong community drive uh, was really important and just being open uh, to hearing what people had to say and, and uh, changing the plans uh, to help them uh, understand what we were doing there and things like that. And we had a really good friends group um, I'd say one of the best friends groups in the state of Minnesota, and that really helped. And really, um, we knew that that was going to bring in people, but as, as Craig said, we didn't really realize how big of a thing it would be. And so when you work for a state agency like the DNR, it's hard to pivot, but I have to say we did it really quickly. And I, I'll, I'll give credit to Alex Watson, our regional naturalist, because we brought the bison back in, in September, but by January, we were actually uh, training our first citizens bison ambassadors, uh, which Gwen is also a member of. And that has really made a big um, help in that we have this group of volunteers that basically from April through October on weekends are up at Setman Mill talking to the public about the bison, answering questions, being the eyes and ears of the park because we just don't have enough staff. And I think that has made a huge um, difference in how the public has embraced the bison, but also understanding what we're trying to do and how to um, respect the bison. And I think the other really important thing is that we didn't really think about is and, and Gwen has talked about this, is by bringing the bison back, uh, Mankato's always had a very, um, I don't know how you would describe it, but a not a very good relationship with Dakota and other American Indian tribes because of the past with the US Dakota War in, of 1862 and things. And this really has been, I think, a healing effort um, so it really even goes beyond just that we bring bison back to the landscape to help it be prairie, but just that whole interconnection to the people that have been part of that landscape for hundreds and thousands of years. That is a, you just led us beautifully into our segue into <laughs> module two. So great job. He's still on his game. So what we're going to do now is we are just going to pause um for about 15 minutes and then come back uh and i'm not i'm not gonna give the time till i'm done talking because we're gonna give you that full 15 minutes to come back in the meantime um panel participants please take a please also take a break like you're allowed a break as well but then when you come back um while we're watching the second video if you could type in um some answers to these questions that are on the screen right now that would be much appreciated and then don't worry, we have 30 minutes at the end of today too. So if there are questions that you're like, I still really want to hear that answered, we'll have time to get that done. So this is, we're gonna close out module one and we're gonna move right in. I wish, 
was like, Bison just grunts, so I can't be like, you know, into module two. It doesn't make as much sense as we're going to move into module two. Just bear with me. It's going to be fine. All right, so we will come back at 10.03, and we'll just type into the chat that we're taking a, a little break here, and so we'll see you back here in 15 minutes. <laughs>